Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome and welcome from Florence. Good evening in Asia and Russia. Good afternoon in Africa and Europe. Good morning in America, the north and the south. To debate today, we have two outstanding experts. Maybe one will appear on your screen. Bleep, bleep. It is our first debate, so we still have to test things. Well, it works. Hello, Denis. Denis Ehrman Hello. from Boston. Denis is one, he is not one, Denis is the leading expert from um, allowances markets, the use of markets to cap pollution. He did start with SO2 and NOx, and now he is leading for CO2, <coughs> greenhouse gas. Denis is also the former director of the Energy and Environment Laboratory at MIT. And before that, I'm not really sure, but maybe he did work a little bit from the US coal lobby. But maybe it was in the past century, so we should forget. And to discuss with Denis, we have another expert. His face should appear. Be. Be. With modern techniques, we cannot wait. Huh? 15 seconds is, is, is eternity. The second expert is again an outstanding expert, Ignacio Perez Ariaga. Ignacio is Spanish, as the name suggests. He's former regulator in Spain and Ireland. He's also professor at Comias University. He's also professor of energy regulation at MIT. And presently, it is Boston. We'll come back to Europe tomorrow. And also, director of training at Foreign School. As you see uh, from their face, they have experience. They know what they, they, what they will say because they did face actual thing in the real battlefield of energy and climate. And we now have everything to start. So I will ask you. Dear guys, a question, and you will answer if it works with the following order: Denis, then Ignacio. I have about ten questions, and after that, I will open to the audience. The first question is quite simple, because we start. In your mind, should energy policy and climate policy go together? Denis, what do you think about this? My answer would be no. I think their objectives are quite different, and uh, both are hurt when they become confused and combined together. Well, I usually yes, agree. Sir. I usually agree with Denny, but I would say yes, and of course I would have to explain. Okay, but then let's step back a little bit. If energy policy and climate policy are not exactly the same thing. What's the proper objective of climate policy in your mind? Uh, I think let's first of all set aside adaptation and geoengineering as part of the climate policy portfolio and the focus for 20 years has been on mitigation, namely the limitation or reduction of greenhouse gases that are emitted into the Earth's atmosphere. And I think that's very clearly the objective, which is to simply reduce those emissions, to limit those emissions, the anthropogenic emissions in particular, and to reduce them. That's the objective. Well, yes, sir. period. Yeah, well, then, then let me explain the, uh, the yes that I have said. I agree with uh, Denny that the uh, objective of climate change policy is to set the um, let me, uh, yeah, to set the limits uh, on the emissions and, and that that limit uh, that affects different sectors um, will uh, trickle down to the energy sector which is a major contributor to the emissions as a constraint as a, as a limit and then, as I see the energy policy, I'm an engineer, I see that as a huge optimization program in which we try to accomplish the goals of energy policy, which is to provide affordable energy uh, in a reliable way and with tolerable 
uh, environmental impact. And that tolerable environmental impact will contain the constraint that is imposed by climate policy. It's up to the energy policy to decide uh, how to deal with that constraint. Uh, you could deal with that as a constraint in the optimization model, so you cannot use technologies that violate the uh, emission constraint, or you could alternatively uh, fix a price, which is for those who understand optimization, the dual variable of the constraint, that um, if the constraint is harder, the price will be higher, and then that price will be set on all those who uh, have emissions, and the, again, the energy policy, the energy sector, will have to cope with that incrementing price. Yeah, let me, I would agree with what Ignacio has just said. It is an optimization problem, but I think there's a difference from saying that some policy affects sectors other than those or, you know, various sectors in the economy. We can think the energy sector is affected by tax policy, for instance. It's, it's going to be affected by climate policy. But it's a different thing than saying you have to coordinate, you have to optimize, and what is the objective? And I think the problem that we face now is that of energy and climate objectives becoming confused. And I believe climate policy is the loser in this, so that we have a tendency to be moving towards climate policy as becoming energy policy in disguise. And I think that's the problem. It's not a problem that they affect each other. It is. When you have climate policy, it will affect energy, and probably in a major way, since that's a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we must accept that. Uh, but the, uh, the issue is always the objective is clearly different than whatever the objective is for energy policy. OK, guys, but you sound as much like economists as philosopher king. What if people simply don't like some kind of energy, let's say nuclear, and want much more of another energy, let's say renewable? Ah, to, to my mind, that's fine. I think every society is free to choose on uh, what they, you know, energy sources they want, uh, <laughs> how they want to use them. I mean, that's a certain services are provided by energy, and so, you know, societies can make that choice. I think the best example would be Germany uh, with the uh, nuclear phase-out. I mean, that's clearly not climate-friendly. It will have consequences on climate policy, but that's an independent objective that's been in German policy for some time, you know, let's say accelerated in terms of the decision-making of Fukushima, which is certainly a major event in, the energy world, uh, <clears throat> and it has effects on, uh, it's going to have effects on greenhouse gas emissions, within Germany at least, uh, and uh, you know, the price of carbon is going to be higher as a result, by some amount, we don't know, but I think that's, again, that has an effect, but that's not to say that people cannot make that choice, and if people want to live in a world of, let's say, renewable energy only, then yes, uh, there's no reason not to to do that, that would be very friendly to climate, from climate purposes, given the carbon characteristics of that form of energy. But I think those are separate objectives. So I think if you think of the nuclear phase out in Germany, there's a very clear objective there. It isn't, it isn't, I don't know if you call it energy policy, but it certainly say we do not like this form of energy, we will cease using it, we're going to phase it out by 2022. Fair enough. It will have effects on other, on other sectors. Yes, sir. Well, I think that there is much more than uh, street economics and the uh, uh, preferences <laughs> of people have to be respected or otherwise mm -hmm. people will, will vote with their feet and they mm. will decide to do this or that. Uh, and that always has preference. Uh, I mean, using the same example of Germany that Denny has um, referred to, but in a different area, uh, Germany is not known for the uh, solar resources that they have, but they have a huge amount of solar rooftops. And, um, and this is another uh, example of how people decide and have preferences. I think that people feel that that gives them empowerment, that they control uh, what the energy sources that they have and they have locally. Uh, and municipalities are flourishing in providing uh, those services 
and getting people happy even they have to, uh, have to pay more. So I think that, that yes, in the end, <coughs> these choices are the ones that run, <coughs> that determine energy policy. And again, coming back to the, to the topic before uh, about the, the different measures in which uh, climate policy interferes with energy policy in the opposite. When uh, the, we, you try to solve the problem of energy policy with the constraint of uh, climate change, uh, and you don't have the the price as the tool that economists would love to have, but politicians would hate that because that increases inflation, increases uh, the the price of electricity, the price of energy in general. So we have to resort to other means, and other means are interventionist. You have to set standards on appliances. You have to uh, set constraints on the. Uh, polluting devices and ways of producing energy. Um, uh, you have to establish targets for clean energies, and all that is bound to to, uh, to preferences that in some cases are determined by lobbies, by politicians, and this is where things get messy, as, as Danny was saying before. Okay, okay, guys, but aren't you, both of you, aren't you to burst in real life? All actual policies are always messy, don't you? Yes, but shouldn't we make it evident that, for instance, the illusion here oftentimes is that, yes, we don't want a price on something, but we're going to mandate one thing or another in the messy politics that Ignacio just talked about. But that cost, there, there is a cost. And I guess what leaves me unimpressed with this form of energy policy is its impermanence and therefore its lack of congruence with the long-term problem that climate change will be, that climate change presents. So that we see even in Germany, there are many rooftops, but said all the people who adopt them, do they pay for them entirely? I mean, yes, they do pay, consumers pay, but is it a shifting from those who adopt to others who are being recovered through the cost of the electricity price? In the United States, there are many people who, you know, put solar rooftops, you get a tax credit for it, the cost is brought down by having other people essentially subsidize uh, that payment. So this notion, I think as economists, as academics, we owe it to the policy process, say yes, but this does cost. This is not a free lunch, it does not, you have the choice, you can have a carbon price. If you don't like a carbon price or you don't like whatever the price happens to be, uh, then, uh, you know, the alternatives are all going to impose the equivalent of a price, a cost, in some manner. I think this goes back to the optimization sort of issue, so we end up, you know, we're always in second, third, tenth best solutions, but uh, we ought to make it clear that, you know, there is a cost there. And I think that cost comes out and defeats these policies. So we see revisions that countries are very hot on one policy and then they cool off because the cost is unsustainable. You can think Ignacio can talk on Spain in that respect, but I understand even in Germany now that the tariffs that were paid for both wind and solar have been brought down significantly. I mean they certainly proved that you can get a lot of solar and a lot of wind if you promise someone a guaranteed price and it's more than what it costs to, to put that on. But the recovery of those costs through the electricity rates have become as I understand it, politically unsustainable, at least at the levels that they were paid. They've met now reduced, so we'll see what that level is or what the response is. And how many more wow. solar, how many more windmills, what will uh, take place at these yes. lower prices? Are you trapped in your show? Is this twist in the reasoning? Well, I cannot agree more with Denny in that uh, this package of measures that uh, countries are implementing are not fully consistent, that the ideal solution would be uh, to have a price that would allocate the burden uh, in a fair way uh, according to the cost of each one of the measures uh, to accomplish the, the goal. But as I have said before, I think that politics at this, at this moment impedes the use of the best instrument, which is price. And then we have to go into the messy arena of a package of different measures. And, um, well, as, uh, then the preferences appear and, the, and politics and lobbies and all that, then the, the strength of the measures that are applied 
uh, are not the right ones. Uh, and then we have a cost, and I fully agree with Denny that um, not choosing the right balance between the different uh, measures that are adopted has a cost, and, and then it is more expensive than it could have been. Um, but I think that, unfortunately, that's inevitable, and that there is another complexity there, which is the, the difference between the short and the long term. So uh, climate change is a very long term problem and although it's affecting us now. Uh, so some measures would be less expensive now. Uh, for instance, uh, renewables are more expensive than energy efficiency. But if we don't do some uh, action now in renewables, as we are doing, uh, sometimes with terrible mistakes, uh, uh, like in Spain, uh, regulatory failures, so do apply the measures in the wrong way and do get too much too early at, at too high cost. But if you don't think of the long term and supporting some uh, technologies early so that by learning by doing and learning by research you get them going, then maybe uh, it is cheaper in the short term but it will be much more expensive in the long run. And that is an, an additional difficulty. But I would point, let, let me just point out one point. Uh, let's, let's make the point that messy as the politics are, Europe, the European Union has managed to put a price on carbon. People may not be happy with it, but the emissions are limited, and they will go down, and that price is not zero. Uh, it was, it was so my there is a question. price, so it can be done. My coming question was, okay, pricing carbon is a pure climate policy. Pushing renewable is rather an energy policy, but it has uh, climate consequences because it, it seems to curb emissions. So. How should I see, as European or even as citizen of the world, the combination of the two, renewable push and pricing carbon? What should I conclude? Like? Well, I'm an economist, as you suggested before, or as you <coughs> noted before. Uh, I think the long-term solution is putting a price on it. Uh, and I guess I would come back to my point that I remain unimpressed with energy policy as the promotion of particular forms of energy that are in favor at particular moments. That it simply is not durable. Where I think we have prices, once they become established, and there's a problem here how to establish a carbon price because you don't have natural scarcity and so governments have to create it. But once you have a price, which I would say is embedded in the European economic world at this point, the legislative and economic world, uh, it doesn't go away. And it, it has a permanent longer term effect, which is what you need, and I think that's what the world will need. So I'm rather unimpressed with, yeah, I'd be the first one to admit, renewable energy, when it is promoted and it's brought in at whatever the price, it's just been abundantly demonstrated in Europe, will reduce emissions. There's no question about it. Will they continue to do so uh, for this period of time as needed, and can it be increased, or can we, uh, you know, have it, you know, more of it? Or there are limits to what you can do there because it is, in a sense, incomplete. Also, um, Ignacio is wondering. You do not know what to answer. It seems, Ignacio. Well, um, I mean, I think that. Uh, Europe has accomplished something that that is difficult <clears throat> is to create the all the organization the mechanics and and all the, the what is needed to have this uh, this price for co2 um, of obviously the 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 problem with the current implementation is that uh, in my opinion has a very little effectiveness so it's it's, it's a well organized system, it has the potential to increase the price or to, to have a, a more strict limits, but at the time I think it's doing very little. So in the discussions I was involved in the, the uh, advising the, the European Commission on the road 2050 and we had uh, like two groups of people. One that said, okay, let's insist on the uh, CO2 price and that will do the trick and we have to set uh, the price or a, a constraint, and this is it. 
And those like me that were saying, fine, this is great, but we have to establish targets for other things. And we know that the targets will not be perfectly consistent, that will be subject to lobbies and all that, but we have to set a target for renewables, we have to set a target for efficiency, because otherwise things will not happen. And um, I mean, regulation I teach in my classes has to be long, loud, and legal. Uh, loud is that it has to be effective, it has to be strong enough, otherwise things will not happen. And then, uh, I mean, it has to be long. People should know what is going to happen with the measure. And again, in the, in the emission trading scheme, uh, we have two short uh, periods in which we know what is going to happen and then we have uncertainty about what is going to take place afterwards. And legal, of course, is legal, it's orthodox, it's the best method. Uh, but it's the best method only applied in Europe. And then we need to, the, the reason politicians don't go for it uh, at full uh, speed is that uh, that will uh, it, that will hurt the competitive competitiveness of European industries and uh, with respect to other parts of the world that don't have the, the scheme. So I think it's the right way to go, but still uh, we are in the first stages. Okay, um, you were right in insisting that there is a kind of uh, political politics involved with these policies, and and the legal the point says that there is a kind of regulatory capture coming with energy policy. But frankly, Denis, why not the same with climate policy being captured? A carbon price has no friends, from what I can observe, <laughs> of, the, of the politics. Uh, but I think the reason it's not, I mean, let's say the, the politics surrounded, surrounding the enactment of climate policy is messy like all politics. But I think it's not a question of the messiness and the lobbying and everything else. It, I think, I would argue in climate, you have this fund, there's a fundamentally different role for government. So I think in energy, we have energy is not naturally abundant so that you know you just whatever energy services light power heat whatever we want you just pick it up off the ground and you and you have it uh, so there there's a natural scarcity and for centuries eon millennia you know humans have organized themselves to deal with that scarcity and the role of government always is to sort of organize and and regulate that's not an argument against regulation you do regulate it in climate the availability of the atmosphere as a dump for the emissions and the effects that we now know are there uh, is there's no scarcity of that dump uh, other than what we impose and the only way that's going to be imposed is by constructing some sort of market or some sort of substitute for uh, what we observe in what I would call natural scarcity uh, occurs. And of course, once you've created that, it's got to be regulated. There's no question. But there's a fundamental difference of the role of government here. The government has to take action to create this scarcity. And I would come back. I'm just unimpressed by the mandate form of trying to create that scarcity. It could be. I mean, the idea is, yes, we will ban coal plants. We will promote this type of energy. We will do this or that. Uh, and so it becomes this con this continual series of measures that come to be adopted that, in the end, typically don't amount to much. But I think that's <laughs> the, the issue is this. We've got to face squarely that the society has got to create a scarcity. And the not only the best and the most efficient, as an economist would say, but the most durable form is to create that scarcity through creating, is, is to create the scarcity which will yield the price which everybody throughout the economy will respond to in every, in every way possible. And uh, if the objective is reducing emissions, that will work. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. Ignacio, convince or it is a bit twisted? Well, uh, I mean, I, I think that um, it's critical that um, that it is clear what the, the purpose of things are, and then that yeah that avoids confusion. And and in the in the very complex world of energy, climate change, as I see, enters as a price or a constraint. I I tend to see it more for the time being as a constraint, although I 
I fully agree with, with Denny in the, the role of the price and the ultimate victory of price. Uh, then then we, are, we are bound to have a bunch of measures. And something that we have not commented but, but creates additional confusion is that some of these measures have attached other purposes. So we are talking about creation of jobs, we are talking about support to local industry, we are talking about uh, helping to develop some regions that are underdeveloped or they need some um, industrial activity. And, and, and that is mixed up with, the, with the, the decision of which are the measures that should promote to, to arrive at the, meeting the constraint, which is the important thing, is to reduce the emissions. And, and that makes things even doubly messy and doubly prone to, um, to lobbying. And, uh, and, and particular interests. Very happy to hear from you, but 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 it's a policy, so it's not made by experts. It's not an academic newspaper on or, or an academic book. So we now have to hear from the audience. I already have two questions from the audience, but others are coming. The first question is quite obvious. It's but according to the debate, what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the new 2030 policy package in the European Union? Ah, good question. Any? Do you want me to answer first? Okay. Well, I think it's, uh, I find the proposal of January interesting in what I would call the sparseness of the objectives, at least as immediately <coughs> actionable things. And what we see is a 40%, the adoption of the 40% target by 2030. That concerns greenhouse gases only. There's what I would call almost a proposal for a technical fix to the emission trading program, which is the market stability reserve. That's a separate issue, but it's focused, of course, on the ETS. Uh, and then there is a concrete proposal to reduce the annual decrement on the emission trading system beyond 2020 by a greater amount, 2.4% instead of the present 1.7% So it's a tightening of the cap. There is a renewable target proposed, 27%, which is, let's say, would not be legally binding on member states, but would be part of the general objective. And then a proposal for a new governance system and energy and coordinating energy and climate, which, as I read it, involves a great deal more coordination of member, st member state actions uh, with respect to meeting these various, various objectives. I think what's remarkable about it, to my mind, is the focus on, I see it as a refocusing on emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions, the climate policy, there's a huge amount of discussion on all the other objectives. Should we have targets and other policies? How do we integrate this with the internal market, with transmission capacity, you know, integrating energy markets and coordinating that with different climate policies uh, that member states may adopt or actions which have effects on uh, climate as, as well as energy. So all of that discussion is out there. That's all sounds like it's to be wrapped up in these, I can't remember what they call them, but I call them energy climate plans, which this new governance structure is to propose by which then these actions are, seek to have greater coordination. Uh, but the concrete actions, the specific actions proposed, are uniquely concerned with greenhouse gas emissions, except we might say this 27% uh, renewable energy proposal, which could argue, uh, is it, you know, how ambitious is it? Is it, in fact, legally binding? Uh, the second question is very astute and very simple. But is the Obama administration going to do better, worse, or nothing? The Obama administration? Yeah. You're asking me, though. We're going to do yes. better, worse, or nothing till 2030? <laughs> I think the, uh, the, the Obama administration, it, let's say, I want to say the Obama administration because I think it's uh, the U.S. is embarking on a experiment as to whether you can get by without a price, or can you create a price in some other means. So, I, I think the climate policy, as such, 
the focus is certainly on what's called the Clean Power, the proposed Clean Power Act, which is essentially the federal government would set the regulation, if it goes final, and it will go final, I'm convinced, uh, uh, would set an, an emission rate target for every state, and every state would have a different target. So the key word here is tradable performance standard. So it's an emission rate standard that's state specific, reflecting the circumstances of various states. And so several things to note. I mean, it's it's complicated. Need to say it's a regulatory approach, although it does everything possible to promote trading. So states, you don't have to adopt a trading system, but you might decide that you want to. You could join Reggie, you could join the California system, you could form multi-state groups and average out these targets and everything. But And there is no, none of the federal government mandating to the states what they must do other than meet this performance standard, which we, the federal government, have given to each and every state according to what we our modeling shows is what can be achieved. It's electric utility only. So it is, it's attempting to, in some ways, maybe in the best of all worlds with this one, everybody would decide trading is the way to go, and so you'd have a trading system built from the bottom that would all be linked to parts, or part of it would be linked. Perhaps certain states will link into California or to Reggie, and so now you'd have these regional trading programs around. That's all to be seen. There's going to be a lot of controversy, a lot of litigation. It'll take a long time to implement it. Uh, I think the price of gas and coal will have more to do with what the United States emissions are than, uh, than that program. But, but we'll see. I think, as I say, I think it, it is an experiment and can you get by without creating a price directly? Well, um, yeah, well, I think that the coming back to the a package of measures for 2030 by the European Union, um, I think that the European Union has to be commended for trying to recover the leadership in a difficult political and economic moment, um, and to to uh, present. Uh, a long-term vision with a plan. Um, still, I think that it does not meet the requirements of loud, long, and legal that I was saying before. Uh, the, still, there is much regulatory uncertainty. As um, Danny was saying, the target of renewables 27% is a target for the entire union with no allocation to member states. And it, it leaves a lot of uncertainty of how that could be implemented. So I think the instruments for implementation are missing. And again, for investors, for people who have to decide to go into certain business or not, uh, for developing of clean technologies, this is not good. <clears throat> I think that some people have said, and I tend to I mean, agree, that there is a lack of amb ambition. Uh, when we look at the, the target for emissions, uh, which is this 40% with respect to 1990, uh, we have achieved already 18% in, in 2012. Uh, we expect with, with the same type of measures that we have now to reach 24% by 2020 and 32% by 2030. So we are talking about 8% more of increase in the reduction of emissions. And we have the target in 2050 to arrive to 80 to 95%. So this is uh, like a straight line aiming at the lower bound, which is 80%. In renewables, we had achieved 13% in 2012. We expect to be in 21 by 2020, and 27, which is exactly the same target, uh, in 2030. So doesn't look like a very strong uh, target for renewables. Um, I think there are people are arguing that there are no uh, measures regarding leakage, uh, no measures regarding the dispersed sectors. I mean emissions. So I think that it is a is a good step. It's it's very good that that uh, Europe has agreed to go in a, to, to have some targets that is centered what has been agreed on on a, a limit on emissions. Um, I think that it is good that there is a target for renewables, but um, I think it's a very modest one. And, um, a, and well, I think that we are waiting for uh, in some information about the instruments, because otherwise 
it will not be not will not be effective. As an observer of the uh, U.S. political arena and and uh, environmental one, I I dare to say that politics makes very very difficult to reach uh, comprehensive agreements as the one that we see in Europe. Uh, it is even more difficult there. I think that uh, I mean uh, surprisingly, uh, in these matters, not in other things, but in these matters, the the states in the United States are more independent, and they they do what they please much more than the member states in Europe. Uh, so it's much more it's much easier to have a directive on climate change, directive on uh, the, the the markets, uh, energy markets, and and many of these measures in Europe for different countries than it is in the states for in the United States. And I think that this is why they are tending towards a much more pragmatic package of measures that could be implemented from the government, because it is very difficult to get to a comprehensive um, uh, regulatory approach. Good. The next question is both candid, hallelujah, and tricky people. If citizens in any country have the right to ban a particular type of energy, let's say nuclear, like uh, in Austria in Europe, do they also have the right to ban imports of this energy? Is it compatible in Europe with the internal free trade general agreement we have? Or even is it compatible with free trade as seen by WTO? What do you think about this? Uh, <laughs> I think it, I think societies clearly can, and they do have the right. I mean, that for better or worse, we're organized as a you know a, a world of nation states, uh, various degrees of sovereignty in in effect. Uh, there are consequences. I, I guess I what I'm always struck by these bans on this or that is yes. People are seem to be united on certain things, but uh, they're not willing to to go without it. And I'm in the U.S. experience. I think we've gone through 40 years of oil imports as a source of energy security, and yet we will never do anything to touch, you know, limiting oil imports because it's essential. Mm -hmm. But that becomes the basis of the rhetoric, and so whether I mean Germany could certainly do without from everything I see that you know the you know, nuclear could be reduced. It's, I think, 20% of total energy supplies that could be done. There will be consequences. Will people <laughs> accept it? I think we do have to keep in mind that this is the third, by my count, the third change in nuclear policy in Germany in something like 15 years. Uh, it seems to be a permanent decision. Everybody's very decided to go this way. But I wonder, 10 years from now, will as 2022 approaches, will in fact these plants be decommissioned. Uh, I think because of lead times, they probably will. Uh, so that can take place. Uh, and citizens appear in Germany to be willing to accept that. Uh, I suspect they will import more power from France, uh, nuclear power from France uh, as a result. Uh, we'll see what France does. Ostensibly here, there's an objective to reduce by 50 percent in the new government. but. Uh, I, I don't think this is a question of rights. It's a question of, uh, and it is a question of democratic processes by which you decide these decisions. And, but you know, in Germany, I, I take it this is a widely accepted. It reflects it. Fair enough. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, what happened in Sweden? This was a national referendum, and nothing's really happened along the lines of the nuclear phase out in Sweden. And is this just well? It was an expression of sentiment. We didn't really mean it as policy, or was it a mistake, but we don't want to admit it? Uh, I, I don't know. But obviously nuclear power has not been phased out in Sweden, despite a national referendum that I don't think can be disputed some 30 years ago that, yes, that's what we're going to do. And yes, sir. Well, I agree with Danny that this is something that this is um, countries have the sovereignty to do that. Uh, can be done with gas, can be done with oil. I would argue, adding something to what Denny has said, that cannot be done with electricity. Uh, in electricity, if you import electricity from other country, you are importing energy that is a mix of everything that happens there. You cannot distinguish between electricity that comes from nuclear or comes from natural gas or comes from wind farms. 
So it is an impossible thing to do uh, in the electricity world, which I think is where where things matter. I mean, if you talk, people buy talk about buying green electricity, for instance. So they sign a contract with somebody, and that somebody will sell green electricity. Well, um, that is a hoax. So it's some. This is doing nothing unless there is additionality. I, I will explain. So if somebody has some company has some nuclear power plants, coal power plants, and uh, wind farms and solar, and they say, I'm going to sell you the solar fraction or the wind fraction, they are doing nothing. They are selling something that they have in their in their mix. So the only way of really purchasing green energy is to see that the extra money that you pay for that green energy goes into something additional. So that company will invest in a wind farm that otherwise would not be profitable or they will build some or plant some trees or do something with that extra money. Uh, so it, in, in electricity it's very tricky to talk about the source of the of the energy and therefore uh, banning imports and all that would not make any sense. I did receive many, many very interesting questions, but we are short of time. So, but, but it's a pity, but we did decide 45 minutes, it's 45, but I do, I do deeply thank first the audience for the many questions arriving now, and we will look at, at the way of handling it better next time, but now I would like, of course, deeply thank Denis and Ignacio. I am 64 years old, I am working in this area since 20 years, and by listening to you, I am still learning, I am really deeply thanking you. Uh, we are intellectuals, we are researchers, we are not in command of everything, but, but we are on us only to explain that we may have a reasoning about all these things, we should have a reasoning, it's possible, and we may have it at the world level. I know that all our faces are Western, I will not deny, but we will look at Asian, Africans, Latin America, Russia, we will look at people <coughs> jumping in the debate for our next editions, because they are, they are matters of world interest. Again, many thanks to our experts and audience, and Ricardo, if you are ready, you can close this first experiment. Yes, thank you, Jean-Michel. Thank you, Jean thank thank you, you Jean Danny. And thank the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, and goodbye to Danny and to Ignacio, and goodbye also to our director, Jean-Michel Grachin. And for now, all the best from me and from the Forest School of Regulation. Goodbye.